answering more of your questions about aircraft noise concerns and how important it is to fly quiet. From the National Business Aviation Association, this is Flight Plan. I'm Rob Finfrock with your trusted source for business aviation news. A recent NBAA news hour addressed the sensitive issue of aircraft noise and adhering to local noise abatement procedures, even when only voluntary. The importance of flying quietly really can't be overemphasized, particularly as we now work to emerge from the COVID-19 crisis, and as residents living near busy airports who've grown accustomed over the past several months to the relative quiet may now resent more than ever hearing business aircraft return to the skies. Panelists on the webinar ran out of time to answer all the questions that came in, so today I'm pleased to welcome them to Flight Plan, starting with Timothy Middleton, CM and Senior Consultant and Aviation Specialist for the Environmental and Transportation Consulting Firm, HMMH. Tim, let's begin with an overview of how airports determine what level of aircraft noise is acceptable. Thanks for this. Since the 60s and the jet age, um, the FAA and the federal government has, have worked to address noise associated with louder aircraft, such as jets. Um, and in the 70s and 80s, there were a few laws that were passed that provided a patchwork quilt of regulation. So a lot of the uh, restrictions on noise were more airport based, where there had mandatory curfews, aircraft could be fined, aircraft could be banned from airports. And um, there were more and more jets flying and Jets were starting to get quieter, and there was a phase out of uh, older stage one and stage two jets. And then um, in 1990, the FAA passed what's known as ANCA, the Airport Noise and Capacity Act. And what that did was that phased out all stage two jets over 75,000 pounds, and it mandated certain ways airports could um, restrict aircraft. So it got rid of the patchwork quilt. And over the past 30 years, um, we've been functioning essentially under ANCA, which makes it easier for airport operators and aircraft operators to talk to flight crews. And so now uh, what we're seeing is that aircraft are getting quieter, but noise complaints are still increasing. And so a lot of that now has to do with we have to work on voluntary measures and really focus on noise abatement procedures to make sure that aircraft are flying uh, as quiet as possible. Thanks for that background, Tim. Also with me is Jeff Smith, Chief Helicopter Pilot for a Part 91 Flight Department and the Vice President of Operations for the Eastern Region Helicopter Council. Jeff is also the Chair of the NBAA Access Committee. Jeff, one webinar attendee asked what pilots should do when air traffic control gives them instructions to turn sooner or to otherwise deviate from the published noise abatement procedure. Now, ATC instructions supersede all that, right? That is correct. But I, I, the advice I would give um, the person that asked the question is uh, a lot of noise abatement programs are under a lot of scrutiny and they're checked quite often. So in the event that happened, of course, you always uh, listen to air traffic control. But I would just advise them to keep a record of it and what happened. And uh, so if they're ever asked the question, they, would, they have it readily available to them. It's like uh, all the people listening to understand uh, how important fly neighborly programs are. And it would be naive to think that uh, it's not. And the number one thing facing the aviation infrastructure is noise and community compatibility. So uh, I would adhere to those fly neighborly roads. I'd go find them if the, if the airport has them. And if they have a voluntary curfew, I'd do my damnedest not to uh, be in noncompliance with that. Is noise abatement information included in airport NOTAMs, Jeff? And is there a recommended noise abatement profile that NBAA endorses for those who fly aircraft lacking such a published profile? So uh, NBAA does have it. If you go in nba.org slash noise, you'll go and you'll see the standard and the techniques. There is no noise abatement uh, information usually in NOTAMs per, per the airport. A lot of that is very resource intended to keep updated. But most airport operations offices and a lot of airports have their own website or the town will have a website with an airport tab, which usually is a pretty good uh, source of information if there's a fly neighborly program. Gabe Andino is manager of noise abatement and environmental compliance at Teterboro Airport and chair of the NBAA Access Committee's Airports Working Group. That makes him the right person to answer this next question. Gabe, to your knowledge, have any airports explored or implemented incentives programs encouraging operators to either avoid nighttime operations or to comply with voluntary curfews? There's some airports that have 
some incentive programs for, for noise abatement compliance. A lot of them are in terms of positive recognition or awards. Um, like Teterboro, we have what we call the Good Neighbor Awards program. And uh, we'll, based on a set of criteria, uh, we'll, we'll award uh, operators that kind of meet the goals that we set out uh, on an annual basis. Usually they, when, when they get any, any sort of notices from us, they tend to be negative. So um, this is kind of like a positive reinforcement effort that we have in place. We've gotten questions about reductions in, in landing fees or, or, or fuel fees or, or, or incentives like that, you know, kind of more of a financial uh, basis. I, I don't know of any airports that have done that. There might be out there. Um, it's something that I think we've here locally at Teterboro, it's been discussed really, really briefly, but uh, otherwise there's not a lot right now, but, but there are some out of the box solutions that could be employed by an airport that, that may want to uh, increase their participation in noise abatement. Gabe, as you know, it's also important for airports to engage with the surrounding community to ensure that both sides understand the factors at work. How has such a dialogue been encouraged at Teterboro? Well, Tudor, we, we've had we've done it for a, a very long time, and it, and it was born out of necessity. Uh, the, our, our airport is uh, one of the older ones in the country; uh, it's over a hundred years old, actually. But in the seventies and eighties, uh, the usage of it kind of progressed to become more of a, a GA reliever and, and more of a business aviation oriented airport. Business aviation really grew uh, and expanded. You know, our, our proximity to New York City, um, you know, kind of makes us uh, a real popular destination and with that you know more jets more noise and and really upset neighbors that were used to a quieter airport once upon a time and now there uh there's jets everywhere so the airport went ahead and, and created a uh, kind of a round table committee to to discuss the issues at hand put the airport's point of view out and, and try to reach a bit of a compromise and, and a lot of it is expectation management of uh, folks living in the airport you you, you present the value, you know, what the airport is actually worth to the, to the community uh, as a whole. Uh, sometimes that's not readily apparent. So, you know, put, putting that information out there, uh, getting pilots involved uh, or based operators involved and, and kind of presenting what they do, um, just just bringing, putting everything out in, in, in the forefront and, and, and making it more tangible for, for the people that live near the airport. And at that point, you know, also listening to their, their concerns and basically showing empathy and then also trying to find solutions. But even just some efforts to, to reduce, make reductions, um, make reductions at night. Uh, you, you know, as long as you're, you're putting an effort that's, that's visible and that you're, you're, you're in good faith, that usually goes a long way to address a lot of the concerns. And, and perhaps you're not going to completely eliminate people's problems as they would wish you would, but you could kind of find kind of a little bit of a middle ground and, and create a, you know, just a really good working relationship. On that subject, we're also joined by Brad Pierce, chair of the Centennial Airport Community Noise Roundtable. Brad, I'd appreciate your perspectives from the community side of such conversations about airport noise in the Denver area. So at Centennial, we have meetings every month. We have a lot of itinerant planes coming in and out. Probably half of the traffic is itinerant or, uh, you know, not based at Centennial. So this Fly Quiet brochure that the roundtable worked with staff to develop works well for pilots who are regular users of the airport. They can refer to that and they, knows where the, they know where the noise sensitive areas are. The other thing that we have done just recently for, I guess it's for anybody at Centennial, whether they're based there or not, we worked with the airport to put up signs uh, on the aprons and the taxiways so when they go to take off they can see it so that's how we actually get the pilots engaged at least through signage secondly we distributed the fly quiet brochure to some of the fbo's at centennial and uh, met with some of the pilots and they put our fly quiet brochure in their um, break room and so trying to get the word out on what flight quiet sensitive areas are at Centennial. Jeff, you have an interesting perspective on this issue, given the recent battle against attempted noise-based restrictions at East Hampton Airport in New York. What avenues and resources are available to airports that may be facing similar attempts to restrict access due to community noise concerns? One thing we found in our battles with East Hampton, the airport or the, or the sponsor, the town, if they wanted to put in kind of restrictions like that, they actually have to follow the Part 161 process, which 
was drawn out and very clearly stated in our uh, litigation with the restriction these and What are some of the differences in noise restrictions and noise abatement procedures for rotorcraft versus fixed wing aircraft, Jeff? The noise abatement procedures are are separate, mostly because the helicopter has the ability uh, of not landing on a runway. So they can use different routes. An uh, airplane uh, doesn't have that luxury. It has to it has to land and take off on a runway, and therefore to have a stabilized approach or departure, then the noise abatement routes have to follow that because safety comes before um, obviously noise abatement. Gabe, we received another audience question concerning flights that comply with noise abatement procedures, except they don't meet the maximum landing weight requirement. What recourse is available to those operators? It's a little difficult to say because uh, some of these regulations on a local level, uh, ultimately it's up to the airport to, to enforce as long as the FAA has, has approved them to to implement those and, and enforce them. So, uh, for instance, um, and coming back to you know to, to my local airport where I worked here, Teterboro, we do have a, a weight restriction as well. Uh, it's not so much for noise as it is just for structural integrity and, and you know, for, for the facility and, and also just to limit the size of the aircraft that utilize it to, to discourage uh, airline service. Once, once upon a time, that's why it was put into place. Um, now it's just to, to make sure that, you know, it, it's DA only and, and to a certain level of DA and, and also for uh, the infrastructure. And we do have we do allow our aircraft that are larger than, than that that are, are potentially can can operate at higher weights, but we do have a system in place to make sure that they're flying within the, within our limits. If it's something that the FAA is, is a, you know in effect allowed them to do, uh, it, it's it's really their call, uh, unfortunately, to you know whether or not even if, even you may meet the criteria, but they may not have the resources to to verify that and confirm it. The next step would be, as an operator, I guess, to, to double check with the local FISDO and see if, the, if there's any any sort of alternative um, that, that can be utilized to allow you to operate. But uh, it's a fair chance that it, it, ultimately it's, it's, it's left to the airport's discretion um, and if, if that regulation's already been accepted by the FAA is enforceable. Brad, I understand you're also dealing with noise issues resulting from the recent implementation of the FAA's Denver Metroplex program. Yeah, what we hear is people way, way far away from Centennial. That they call Centennial's hotline to complain about noise. However, this noise is from commercial jets going in and out of Denver International. So with Metroplex, the FAA has started routing planes over areas way up, way far away from us and way far away from Denver International that never had noise before. So we get that. That's kind of a unintended consequence of doing Metroplex. We had 30,000 operations in May of 2020, which is, you know, we're always in the top five of GA airports in terms of operations. And, and, the, and I think the overall volume of complaints is not that bad, but uh, there are a few um, people that complain all the time. In conclusion, Tim, let's bring this conversation back to you, since we started off by talking about this kind of patchwork of noise abatement requirements and expectations around the country. Is there a single centralized source you'd recommend for up-to-date information on noise requirements at U.S. airports? Actually, right now, there is not a current up-to-date uniform, I guess, repository for all the noise abatement restrictions. There is what's called the Boeing website. So Boeing used to keep track of all of the, the noise abatement restrictions. That site's still active and live. So some of the older restrictions or measures are still there. But what we generally would recommend to pilots and operators is to contact the airport. If they have a noise abatement office, so generally the best is to contact and talk to the noise abatement office. If not, then talk to the operations department, because if there's any local uh, noise restrictions, the operations department, um, they'll, they'll be aware of those things. You can also contact the local tower. So when you're doing your flight planning, talk to the tower and the tower should be aware of that as well. And I guess in terms of some of the patchwork, we had mentioned some of the use restrictions. If you do have questions about use restrictions, as Gabe said, one of the things you can do is, is contact the local, the FISDO. You can contact the FISDO, contact the ADO, and, and just, just you might even have to have a meeting with them to see, you know, um, are these procedures in place current and to have that conversation with the FAA in the airport. And the other, other website right now is there's a website called Whisper Track. And that's a, a service that airports put out their noise abatement procedures on, and it fits into iPads and tablets. So you can 
You can have it uh, matching your JEP charts. Um, and when you're doing flight planning, Whisper Track is a good way to see if airports that have noise event procedures have published a Whisper Track. It's not exhaustive, but it is more up to date, I would say, than the Boeing website. Members who haven't yet seen the NBAA NewsHour webinar, COVID-19 Changing Aviation Noise Expectations, New Fly Quiet Info You Need, should check it out at nbaa.org forward slash news dash hour. And as Jeff mentioned earlier, additional information about noise abatement procedures and concerns across the country is available at nbaa.org forward slash noise. And that's the latest from the National Business Aviation Association. Remember, you can subscribe to all Flight Plan episodes at Apple Podcasts in the App Store. Wherever you find your favorite podcasts, including by asking Alexa or another connected device, or download them from nbaa.org. I'm Rob Finfrock, and thanks for listening to Flight Plan. Flight Plan.